Okay, uh, actually, I seldom appear on TV these days because of the changing media environment in Hong Kong. Actually, uh, some media organizations actually won't interview me in these days, which is actually a well-known uh, phenomenon if you talk to journalists in Hong Kong. Well-informed journalists in Hong Kong, there are, there are certain people that certain media would interview. And then uh, for, I think, more than half of the interview, or more, more than half of the media organizations, they won't interview me for obvious uh, reasons of, uh, related to political changes in Hong Kong. Uh, I was told that uh, today's lecture actually forms part of a history class. So I feel obliged to adopt a kind of a more historical perspective. So that's why I come up with this title the evolution of the democratic movement in Hong Kong. And, uh, and also an important reason is that I sometimes, uh, my uh, analysis or writing also sometimes adopts a historical approach in the sense that uh, uh, Leo talked about the, uh, the book I published uh, in 2007. If you really read that book, uh, you will know that I kind of, I have a chapter, uh, a couple of chapters actually on the colonial regime and the passage to put the post-colonial stage. Uh, in, in, in that regard, because I believe that a lot of the, uh, if you want to understand the political development of Hong Kong today, you need to understand its history. Because a lot of the political development uh, fr from the political science perspective, I would say is path dependent. Uh, and of course, especially for a number of young people here, uh, I think you may have a very uh, relatively few understanding about the colonial era. Uh, so that's uh, what I would do. Uh, today's talk, I think I will divide into three uh, parts. The first part is a little bit of history up until uh, 1980s. The second part is, a, a kind, I, I I'll give you a kind of a framework thing. That is, uh, if we want to analyze the the democracy movement or the struggle over democracy in Hong Kong, uh, there are several factors, contextual factors or the whole setting that you need to understand. The third uh, part will be related to what I call three issues that have been troubling uh, the democracy movement in Hong Kong, uh, which is uh, kind of repeating a theme that, uh, uh, that is uh, embodied in uh, a book chapter that a ch on a ch in an ch edited Chinese volume uh, uh, published last year, uh, which I kind of see the uh, democracy movement in Hong Kong uh, uh, by a kind of a evolutionary perspective. So the first thing first, I would like to discuss the uh, situation in the early colonial regime. By early colonial politics, I mean largely the post-war uh, era to up until the 1970s. And then uh, it is important to understand that at that time, Hong Kong has no democracy. The governor appointed from London was actually owned di 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 dictatorial power. The latest patent and royal instructions, the constitutional documents actually gave him all the power. Uh, uh, to the extent that people would say that how powerful is the governor? It was like a king, like the British king before the advent of democracy. So it was like he, he was supposed to be the, uh, incarnate, uh, the representative of the king or the queen in Hong Kong. So he was very powerful. And then uh, the legislative council was all appointed. There were no elections before 1985. And then uh, for a large period, long period of time, actually most of the Legislative Council members were government bureaucrats, British bureaucrats. And then, the, and then they, of course, they appointed uh, some uh, major businessmen, uh, uh, Chinese businessmen, into the Legislative Council later, but there was no democracy. And then um, a lot of people tried to explain Hong Kong's post-war political development. Because Hong Kong was seen as an anomaly in the sense that it developed very fast, modernized very fast, but it did not have a lot of instability as in a lot of third world countries in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it, is a, it was a relatively stable place. But then uh, Hong Kong had no democracy. 
And in the early post-war years, actually Hong Kong had a very low level of welfare uh, protection. Uh, labor protection was very poor because Hong Kong was always well known as a laissez-faire, uh, low interventionist uh, state. And then the government provided very little uh, welfare protection. I, I'm not going into detail here, but if you want to understand it, uh, I can tell you stories. But uh, so the dominant explanation about the relative stability without democracy in Hong Kong in the post-war years were by political culture of the Hong Kong Chinese. So the dominant explanation would be by uh, uh, Professor Lao Siu Gai, uh, who actually come up with a couple of explanations. One is refugee mentality. Refugee mentality means that the post-war inhabitants of Hong Kong, most of them, my parents' generation, were refugees from China. They did not originally live in Hong Kong. So they came to Hong Kong after 1949, in the 50s and the 60s, escaping the political turmoil in China and economic hardship in China and came to Hong Kong. So it was different from a lot of colonies. A lot of British colonies, they originally had a lot of people. Then you, the, you militarily occupy that place and those people may resist colonial rule. But Hong Kong's different because Hong Kong's inhabitants, a lot of them came to Hong Kong knowing that Hong Kong was a colony. And then, uh, so, there are several sp special features about this mentality. One is that they think that those people who came to Hong Kong think that stability is very important because they came to escape from the turmoil in China. They think that making a living, making themselves fit is very important. And then uh, they did not have long-term plans because they were refugees. And then they did not have a strong sense of belonging to Hong Kong because they still have a kind of sense of belonging to China or their hometown in, back in China, somewhere mostly in Guangdong, different uh, hometowns in Gang, Guangdong. Uh, Lao Siu Gai also came up with another important explanation was about uh, political participation. That was, uh, he think that uh, Hong Kong people at that time were mostly uh, materialistic. Materialistic in the sense that they focus on making money. And then they think that family values are very important. So that was kind of a Confucianist argument about a passive political culture of Hong Kong. But the political situation was that who were dominant at that time? At the very beginning, the business elites, firstly, the British trading firms were the most important uh, political players because they control the economic uh, uh, mainstreams of the most of the uh, economic impacts in, in the colony. And then later, when Hong Kong began to industrialize, the uh, Chinese merchants, Chinese industrialists began to get involved. And then by that time, but, but there was no election. So the colonial government strategy was to pacify these leading elites by appointment, by appointing them into the legislative council. So these rich Chinese businessmen actually uh, serve as a kind of a bridge uh, between the colonial government and the Chinese society. And, uh, but there were limited demands for political reform. There were uh, groups which would uh, claim that uh, uh, the Hong Kong government should democratize, should introduce elections, but there were very few social mobilization uh, from the public uh, to demand democracy in Hong Kong. And then, uh, but there were low level of intervention into society. So the British uh, governing strategy was that, okay, uh, you want, culturally, they won't do anything to Hong Kong. So if you want to celebrate uh, Chinese New Year, go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to make you all believe in Christianity, of course, uh, etc. I don't want to transform your culture. And then they did not intervene a lot into the economy. So for a lot of these refugees, coming to Hong Kong, they think that it's okay. You just leave me alone. Uh, I came, uh, if I c could not make a living, that is my problem, and then I don't ask anything from your colonial government, but then I can be happy if I could not make a living, then it's my problem. So this is the colonial situation. Uh, up until the 1970s, we usually see the 1970s as an important stage of the rise of social movements and student movements in Hong Kong. And then first it was the student movements, uh, which usually uh, we would say that it started in early 1970s, 
First, with some of these uh, student movements were mostly uh, nationalistic, uh, including the protection of Delhi Island movement. So, do you know where is Delhi Island? Young guys? Uh, a series of islands of, of Okinawa, you know Okinawa? And then, uh, and then uh, so at that time, it was like the, the United States returned these islands back to Japanese sovereignty. And then uh, a lot of the Chinese, overseas Chinese, uh, are opposed because they think that, that sh those islands should belong to China. And then Hong Kong people, uh, stay, uh, mostly sta students at, the f at first, stage an important uh, 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 movement to claim that these islands belong to China. And of course, this was uh, not actually directed against the colonial government. It was a show of national identity in the sense that they believed that we need to say out loud that we are Chinese. And then we supported national recovery of uh, sovereignty over these islands, although these islands uh, were, not, were actually not inhabited uh, up until today. And then uh, the Chinese movement, that is uh, to make Chinese, the Chinese language, the official language of Hong Kong. Because before 1975, actually English was the only official language in Hong Kong. So if you write a letter to the government in Chinese, they would ignore it because it was not an official language. So the, the student movement at that time, uh, about, uh, including the anti-corruption movement, which was the early uh, precursors of movement, that spilled over to 1970, late 1970s, began more social movements, pressure group actions, uh, including that, and the pressure group movements at that time were mostly focused on livelihood issues, housing, education, social welfare, because it was, uh, uh, Hong Kong was one of the places where income polarization was very high. And then there are two important uh, things that you need to look at this. Why the 1970s? Why not earlier, why not later? Uh, an important reason was, the explanation was that these are new baby boomers. Those young people who were actually born in Hong Kong after the Second World War, uh, who were what now we call the second generation Hong Kong people, that they were different from their earlier father's generation, that they actually were born and grew up in Hong Kong. So they had a stronger sense of belonging to Hong Kong. And also they were better educated. And then they were more westernized, more uh, clean. Of course, in the 1970s, it was a lot under the uh, student movement waves or in, in, uh, all over the world in the 1960s. So they were under the influence of a lot of these uh, progressive actions in the Western world. And then so these people began to uh, start movements, which we usually see as the precursor of the 1980s democracy movement uh, in Hong Kong. And, but important point is that uh, they, it also marked a rise of a Hong Kong identity. Before that, uh, the older generation, usually refugee mentality, they believed that they are Chinese. But these people were, this generation were actually born in Hong Kong, grew up in Hong Kong. They had stronger sense of belonging to Hong Kong. So we usually attributed this to uh, the rise of a Hong Kong identity, beginning of the rise of a Hong Kong identity in Hong Kong, Hong Kong people saying that we are Hong Kong. Uh, 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 instead of, but those people at that generation, they still believe that, well, we are Chinese. We are nationalist, uh, nationalistically Chinese. That is, uh, they, they still believe, we are both, uh, Chinese and Hong Kongese, but, but they did have a lot of uh, better attachment to Hong Kong. So entering 1980s, we usually uh, say that the democracy movement in Hong Kong largely started in 1980s. Why 1980s? Because the, of the Sino-British negotiations over Hong Kong, which started in 1982. And then um, uh, before that, a lot of Hong Kong people did not care about the political future. Very little discussion about politics. But then uh, 1982, uh, when Margaret Thatcher went to Beijing to try to extend the treaty over Hong Kong, uh, then, uh, of course, she uh, suffered a serious setback and then fell down in front of uh, Mao's mausoleum uh, 
and then uh, and then at that time we had a we had a special term for that event, but uh, which could not be repeated in a university classroom, and then uh, and then uh, but actually it stirred up a lot of discussions among Hong Kong people. Is China going to take back Hong Kong? Remember that at that time it was something not too long after the Cultural Revolution. A lot of people in Hong Kong actually escaped communism to come to Hong Kong. So they were very afraid of the communists taking over. And then uh, what would happen? So it was a period of politicization uh, of the Hong Kong population, especially the young people. Uh, the young professionals who had been uh, 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 engaging in the uh, social movements in the 1970s. So different groups began to put forward different proposals. So what are we going to do? Uh, do, we, do we support Brit continual British rule, or do we con uh, support uh, China uh, recovering sovereignty, or do we want whatever? So, uh, and it was actually a very short period of time. The Sino-British negotiations from the formal starting of negotiations to the fin signing of the John Declaration is only about 20 months. So, but at that time, a lot of people got agitated in Hong Kong. Uh, of course, there were a, a lot of uncertainties involved. Uh, uh, a lot of people began to prepare for immigration. I am sure that a lot ended up here in Vancouver. And then, uh, but uh, it, is, it was an important uh, period of time when uh, people began to discuss the political future of Hong Kong. So the signing of the John, but important in the sense that the John Declaration signed in 1984 and then the basic law, the mini constitution of Hong Kong, which uh, was a the drafting of which began in 1985, actually promised Hong Kong would have democracy. That is, Article 45 of the basic law says uh, the chief executive will, it will ultimately be elected by universal suffrage. Uh, the Article 68 says that the uh, legislative council is ultimately will be fully elected by universal suffrage. So it started a kind of a uh, democratization process. And then, uh, so the British also began to introduce local elections in the early 1980s. So it was a period of uh, limited uh, democratization, uh, which was kick-started kick in the early 1980s. For a lot of these middle-class professionals, which uh, a lot of them had engaged in social movements in the 1970s, if you talk to these people, they would say that at that time we thought that it was a major chance of uh, opening up of political opportunities. And for them, it was a kind of a very logical progression that in the 1970s, we fought for social reforms. We did not touch on the power structure, but 1980s, it was decolonization, decolonization, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong. Hong, who are the Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong? It's us, right? Uh, it's the new generation. So if we had democracy, uh, then we would move into a kind of a con uh, from social reform to political reform. And then the power structure will be changed. And then we are going to build a democracy. And on the other hand, the more pessimistic view is that actually China, of course, promised one country, two systems, high autonomy. but. China is not a democracy, was not a democracy, and it's not a democracy after all. So uh, to what extent can we trust them that uh, our freedom, rights, autonomy are going to be protected? So a lot of people at that time would say that the best safeguard against Beijing's intervention would be a democratic government. So uh, at that time, so uh, 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 important rallying cry at that time, in, uh, starting in the 1980s, were in Cantonese so-called Manju Kong Kong. That is, you resist communism by democracy. So why do you need a democratic government? Because that can resist the, demo, uh, resist the communists. Uh, otherwise, they will step in, they will intervene into Hong Kong affairs, etc., etc. So this finished the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk, I would like to uh, uh, introduce about uh, how we could see the uh, struggle over democracy. The good or bad thing from understanding Hong Kong's democratic struggle was that it has lasted for 30 years, but something never changed. 
Something that has changed could be a good thing if you're a scholar to understand something, right? You have some kind of fix. The frustration is that something never changed. Uh, so for, for some people who have been participating and observing the democracy movement for 30 years, I sometimes was sick of uh, hearing the same argument all over again. Had we already rebooked this argument 30 years ago? So how come you guys still put, that for, put forward that argument after 30 years? And, but some things never change. The first thing is, uh, there is, what are the, uh, it was a kind of a protracted, what I would call protracted bargaining between various actors. Uh, the first actor, of course, the most important, who really called the shots, is the Chinese government. So the Chinese government uh, actually had never been sympathetic to full democratic development of Hong Kong. But uh, they, they uh, speaking with hindsight, they are going, they can tolerate some elections a limited opposition in Hong Kong to show the world that it is one country, two systems, Hong Kong is a free place, and then, but uh, they would be very hesitant to uh, provide for a system which the Democrats could really take power, namely in a fully democratic system that would not be allowed. And then the second major actor, of course, is the business in Hong Kong. The business sector in Hong Kong were largely, were an are largely very conservative. And then, uh, of course, to begin with, they were the Western interests. The original system protected them very well. And they were always afraid that democratization would mean drastic redistributive policies, taxing them, and then uh, adding a lot of welfare, and then which would hurt their interests. And then also, since the 1980s, the businessmen would know that the Chinese government actually are not very forthcoming about democracy. So uh, as days go by, when more and more businessmen actually are doing business in China, then they knew that uh, they are not going to mess with the Chinese government. They are not going to hurt their own business opportunities uh, by siding with democracy, uh, so siding with the Democrats, and then antagonizing China. So for a period of something like 30 years, most, for most of the time, the business sector in Hong Kong, the major tycoons, actually were against democracy. Uh, and then uh, the pro-Beijing politicians and groups, including parties, uh, labor unions, uh, residential uh, uh, associations, and also other kinds of community groups, uh, sports groups, cultural groups, and then they were also usually siding with the Chinese government. And then, of course, there are still the Demo Democrats in Hong Kong and the pro-liberal uh, civil society, social movement groups uh, in Hong Kong who are for democracy. And then they, for a period of something like 30 years, they were mobilizing repeatedly uh, for, to dem uh, demand uh, full democracy, uh, progressive uh, democratization for Hong Kong. The fifth actor was the British government. Uh, which played an important role in the 1980s and 90s. But of course, after 1997, they did not play uh, any very important role. Uh, the British government's uh, position actually warranted some explanation. Uh, at the very beginning, I think they thought that uh, they could still run Hong Kong from 1984 to 1997. I signed the treaty and returned Hong Kong to you by 1997, right? In between the 13 years, I was still the boss. So, so they f thought that they could push some democratization in Hong Kong, just as what they did in other colonies and then uh, before they left. But then uh, by mid-1980s, the Chinese government began to sound out warnings, said that you don't do anything without my consent because you don't leave a system, you don't build a system and then uh, leave it at 1997 and force me to take your system. So uh, by 1985, actually the British government had kind of uh, retracted on their democratization attempts. And then because they, they are not going to hurt the relationship with China uh, for the democracy of Hong Kong, up until 1989. When 1989 was an important major watershed event because of what? The fall of the Berlin Wall. No, I, no. Tiananmen. Tiananmen because of the Tiananmen crackdown. 
the Tiananmen crackdown actually hurts the Chinese government's reputation and image all over the world. And the British government was under a lot of pressure. That was uh, the, the catchphrase at that time was, how could you hand over 6 million Hong Kong people to a regime who rode tanks over students? And this was the conservative government at that time was under a lot of international and domestic pressure about what they would do about Hong Kong. So they began some kind of last ditch effort to push more democracy in Hong Kong, uh, bringing forward uh, Chris Patton to serve as the last governor of Hong Kong. So I, uh, but uh, of course after 1997, I think uh, the British government fought, uh, played very little role in the democracy struggles in Hong Kong. Okay, the setting. You need to understand the setting. The setting uh, of the Hong Kong's democracy movement and democratic struggle was a very peculiar thing. There are several things which are stand out. The first thing, of course, uh, you need to understand what is one country, two systems. And then it is very difficult to explain that in a couple of minutes. Uh, one country, two systems is uh, what was guaranteed in the John Declaration and the Basic Law and high autonomy. Uh, which means that actually, according to this uh, rule, the Chinese government should only be responsible for national defense and the diplomacy of Hong Kong. And the internal affairs of, the Hong, of Hong Kong should all be handled by the Hong Kong government. And then Hong Kong should be able to continue its own uh, system of laws, including the original common law system, uh, the original continuation of the original laws be before 1997, judicial independence, uh, the original rights, personal freedom, were, uh, pr freedom of press, freedom of uh, information, freedom of speech should be maintained beyond 1997. And then China should not intervene. And then, so what I would call is a kind of a liberal autocracy. Liberal autocracy is that in, in the sense that it, I believe that a lot of you had lived in Hong Kong and or travel in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong is a very free city, uh, as free as any modern Western city in a developed world. And then you had uh, freedom to criticize the government. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any people who were arrested or beca before or, uh, because they criticized the government. Otherwise, I won't be here. And I would have been in jail like 20 years ago. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you have a relatively free media, and then criticism, and then, uh, and, then, uh, and then the rule of law and judicial independence is there. So it was, uh, but there was no democracy. The government was not democratically elected. And then, um, so uh, the chief executive by today is only elected by a election committee uh, of 1,200 people. Uh, who are these 1,200 people? We're mostly representing the uh, major, most important business and professional groups, which a majority of, a majority of which Beijing could control. Actually, if, they would, Beijing, if Beijing suggests a certain candidate or support a certain candidate, actually a lot of these uh, representatives would not vote against him or her. And then, so it was a kind, I would always say that this is a kind of a de facto appointment system. Uh, that uh, the, this uh, election committee is going to anoint whoever designated by Beijing. Only the half the, of the legislature was, is popularly elected by one person, one vote. Although it is kind of fairly conducted uh, uh, in, in, until in recent years. And then it is, uh, so the Democrats, if you're the Democrats, you can mostly run for these uh, half of the Legislative Council. Uh, if you were average citizen, you can only cast a vote for this half of the Legislative Council. And then, uh, but there is the constitutional promise of full democracy, as I mentioned. It was written in the basic law. So it was a kind of a constant struggle from the population from the public, from the pro-democracy opposition, it said that when is this going to be delivered? And it is a lot like a lot of the uh, uh, hybrid regimes in, in, uh, in the current world that because constitutionally you were promised democracy, uh, 
then it created kind of a legitimate problem for the current government. So you are supposed to be transitional, right? And you cannot say that democracy is a bad thing because it was the constitutional goal of Hong Kong. You, you cannot say that basic law leads us to doom. Uh, the ultimate constitutional goal is a bad thing, so universal suffrage must be a good thing. And there is a majority support of the Democrats. So partial elections were introduced since 1991. And at that time, only 30% of the legislature was, incre uh, was elected, uh, gradually increased to 50% by 2004. And then uh, for some 25 years, Remarkably, the Democrats uh, in Hong Kong enjoy about 55 to 60 percent of the vote in these limited elections. And repeated opinion polls since the 1980s also show that usually it is like 60 percent uh, agreeing to faster democratization or full democracy. About 20 something percent opposing. Another 15 or 10 percent usually no opinion, neutral, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is, again, a kind of a remarkably consistent pattern in Hong Kong, uh, which has never changed, which uh, I was very surprised. It did not happen that way at other, other places in the world. From 91 to 2016, the Democrats never dropped below 55%. So, uh, and then, uh, but of course, they could only win, win some seats in the legislative, uh, in the legislative council. And then uh, because the functional constituencies were kind of mostly won by the conservative business and professional elites. And then uh, the functional constituencies, do I have functional constituencies? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sick of this. But uh, OK, the, the other half of the Legislative Council was elected by so-called functional constituencies that guaranteed business representation. These are like seats which have franchise uh, limited only to business and professional groups and selected social groups, which like uh, the, uh, about half of these functional constituencies were elected by business corporations. And then only the corporate owners had the vote. The employees did not have the vote. And then uh, professionals elect their own representatives. So each medical doctor has a vote. The medical profession elects one representative. Each lawyer has a vote. The law, uh, lawyers have their own representative that makes up half of the legislature. And then the important point is that for the Democrats in Hong Kong, they could win about 60% of the popularly elected seats. But they could win only a few seats in these functional constituencies. So the situation is that they were rendered a kind of a permanent minority in the Legislative Council. So this is one major important setting of the Hong Kong struggle over democracy. These camp, they are in support of democracy. They consistently got a majority support in public opinion. That, but they are only the minority in the legislature. So every time it comes to vote, they lose. And then the government win, but the government does not have majority of public opinion support. And then, but they win nonetheless. Uh, so, but the constitutionally, it promises democracy. For the Chinese government, it is relatively easy to understand the position. If I give one person one vote, the Democrats will win. Then they are anti-China and then uh, whatever. Then, then we will lose control. So this is the uh, situation. So they are in permanent minority in the Legislative Council. And then the Beijing constitutionally holds the final keys of approval. According to the basic law, if, you are, if we are going to uh, set a uh, devise a proposal for uh, changing the electoral methods to the chief executive and the legislative council, uh, it needs uh, the chief executive's proposal. Uh, it needs two thirds majority uh, in the legislative council to pass. And then uh, ultimately, Beijing needs to approve it. The National People's uh, Congress needs to approve it. And then, so Beijing can always veto it. And then uh, pro Beijing groups, as you can imagine, they are very resourceful, as it elsewhere in the world. And then, uh, so when it comes to election times, they, are, they have so much money. And then uh, in that case, they, are, they have the edge in terms of resources. But ideologically, 
most people in Hong Kong still want a democracy or better defense of the human rights, autonomy, and uh, rule of law. And that's why they would, a, a lot of them, especially middle class people, would uh, uh, vote for the Democrats. So over a matter of like 30 years, I see cycles of mobilization and demobilization. There were times when uh, mobilization were, was running high, and then uh, people thought that we are going to get democracy this time, but then Beijing said, no, 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 you're wrong. And then uh, people got this illusion and then helpless, and then uh, after a few years, they got angry again, and then they will come again. Uh, so, so this is uh, the setting, what we call the setting of uh, democratization of Hong Kong. Uh, then I come to the third part, the three eight major issues uh, related to democrat uh, democracy movement in Hong Kong. For the Democrats in Hong Kong, for something like 30 years, they have been struggling over how to deal with three issues. That's my classification. The one is attitude to China. The second is that how do you deal with the system? How do you deal with the establishment? If you can't beat them, join them, or what do you do? You want to play moderate or you want to play radical? The third issue is the class issue. And then uh, the first issue, of course, you can understand. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, I will jump this in. The, the first issue that you can understand is the attitude to China. OK, China is the sovereign master. China is going to ultimately call the shorts. So if you want to get full democracy, you need China's approval. So what do you do with China? And then uh, since the 1980s, one of the problem was tension, what I would call the tension between nationalism national, uh, and uh, Hong Kong identity. For a lot of these Hong Kong Democrats, they would say, at the very beginning, they would say that we are Chinese nationals, of course. And then, uh, but we also want democracy for Hong Kong. And these are not contradictory. Uh, we are not anti-government, anti-China. But uh, it is important to learn that actually the Democrats in Hong Kong uh, actually were on relatively good terms with the Chinese government in the early 1980s. The reason being that they actually, a lot of them had kind of a social movement background in the 1970s. They were anti-colonial. So when the Sino-British negotiations began, a lot of them actually supported China recovering sovereignty over Hong Kong. Whereas a lot of the business conservatives, which later turned into pro-Beijing conservatives, actually at that time supported continual British rule. So, uh, and then, so the, for the Chinese government at the very beginning, in the early 1980s, they would say, oh, these guys are patriots. And then at least they don't sell out to the British. And then these guys can be uh, pacified by giving them some democracy. Giving you the real power, we, I won't do, but I won't tell you that time. And then, uh, so, the turning point was 1989. 1989, again, was Tiananmen crackdown. But it was because the Democrats in Hong Kong actually were firmly behind the Beijing democracy movement. And then uh, we, are, we are commemorating the 30th year of the crackdown this year, 20, 2019. I never imagined I would go to a 30th anniversary of this event. Uh, but, but, but actually, I couldn't make that. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't be in Hong Kong. But, but it was like, uh, if you see CNN, the candlelight vigil, the annual candlelight vigil in memoration of the June 4th crackdown in Tiananmen was still one of the Hong Kong events that would appear on CNN almost every year. And then uh, after so many years, there was something still alive, something people like 100,000 people joining every year. And then uh, the turning point was that a lot of Hong Kong people supported the Beijing democracy movement, including the Democrats. So they sent a lot of materials, help uh, to the Beijing uh, democracy movement. Uh, and then for the Chinese government, they said, these guys are subversives. You want to overthrow me? So, uh, so the, this marked uh, an important watershed event in the sense that they were accused as anti-China after 1989. And then 1992 was the coming of Chris Patton. And Chris Patton began to push some democratization reforms. 
And the Democrats in Hong Kong were also behind Chris Batten because they supported democracy. So they were accused by the Chinese government as pro-British. So you are anti-China, pro-British, uh, destabilizing Hong Kong in Cantonese, Fan Zhong Lun Gong. They have been uh, shouldering this label for some 25 years with, uh, until recently, which they have been accused by the localists as Dai Zhonghua. And then, uh, so uh, this is one thing. And uh, so for 25 years, it has been the major political cliffage in Hong Kong. That is, how do you deal with China? Do you adopt a confrontational attitude? And then you add, uh, because you see Chinese government as the most important threat to Hong Kong's autonomy, democracy, rule of law, and freedom? Or do you try to engage with the Chinese government? The other side, the pro-Beijing side, of course, accused the Democrats as unpatriotic. And you are destabilizing. In order for Hong Kong to develop well, you need to maintain a good relationship with China so that you can have good economic development. And our economy is going to be more and more dependent on China. In that case, you should maintain a good relationship with the Chinese government. Otherwise, it will be not good for Hong Kong's development. So this is, has been the major political cliffage, political difference between various groups and parties in Hong Kong. But the problem is there was no institutional channel by which the Hong Kong Democrats could engage the Chinese government into any kinds of negotiation. That is because a lot of them were actually refused entry into China uh, after 1989. So, and then they, the Chinese government just refused to talk to them. The only people who could talk to the Chinese government were the tycoons, were the Hong Kong government officials, pro-Beijing figures in Hong Kong, and then those people, of course, were conservative. They were not supportive of democracy for Hong Kong. So, uh, so this is uh, one of the basic contradictions in, about uh, democracy in Hong Kong. So there has been uh, an important debate within the pro-democracy opposition that what should we do with the Chinese government? Should we be more confrontational uh, and then mobilize mobilize and mobilize and try to force them into some kind of negotiations. Or we try to be more moderate. We try to talk to them. Uh, try to maintain a good relationship with them and then so that they can talk to us so that they would not mistrust us that much and then we can start a, some kind of dialogue uh, over uh, democratization. But uh, for some years, this has been the struggle. But uh, a major change was that uh, in the last 10 years, because of the deepening of the Beijing's intervention, actually we see a trend of radicalization. That is, you are not getting anywhere by talking to Beijing. Beijing is not going to talk to you. Uh, they are going to control Hong Kong, and then it's going to be more oppressive. And then gradually, the more radical wing uh, got more influential because you cannot engage China in terms of uh, talking them over to get democracy in Hong Kong. The second issue uh, is the, how to deal with the government or the establishment. Uh, since limited elections were introduced in the 1980s, there had been a debate within the Democrats that do we want to join these elections? Because it is only limited. To run or not to run? You only have 30%. You are going to be in a minority. Uh, if you join the system, it legitimizes the undemocratic system. But of course, if you don't join the system, they will win it all. They will win it all, and they, they will claim that they represent Hong Kong people. So what do you do? Uh, over a number of years, the dominant, uh, uh, dominant strategy is to uh, run for the elections. Because uh, the, uh, they think, a lot of them think that you can fight for reform through your institutional positions in the legislature, district councils, etc. And also these seats actually give you a platform to voice your opinion, to actually uh, do propaganda, and then make your views well known to the public. And also it provides important financial resources because these seats carried uh, allowances and subsidies from the government, which the parties can, be, can use to develop their own party network. And uh, the other possibility is to do it by street level action. 
In theory, in theory, these two are not contradictory. That is, you can do party politics and then you can do street level uh, protests. But then there is one problem, one dilemma is that do you go, if you want to run for elections, you usually go for the median voter position, right? You need to go for the moderate people, moderate middle class people, and then you don't want to go very radical. If you want to uh, go populist, go radical, then you can, may be able to agitate more people and then uh, do violent and uh, dramatic things. But that is not usually not very good for winning over the majority. So for a number of years, again, the, in the democracy movement, there was the struggle of, about they should cater for the median voter position, with namely maybe the 50% the plus one uh, voter, and then or do you want more street level mobilization just to do uh, more uh, dramatic uh, w uh, actions so as to force, into action, force Beijing into action. And, uh, but in the recent years, uh, because of the stage in per permanent minority, then, uh, then because the minority is shrinking influence, because the government in the last 10 years or so began to uh, do it more often by pushing through the legislation. And then uh, regardless of minority opposition, and then they cut short discussions, and then uh, abrogate committee meetings, and then they just force through. And then uh, for this gave rise to a lot of the more radical actions. Because for the Democrats, they say that uh, a lot of uh, voters were protesting. Are you going to go there, speak against the bill, vote for it, lose it, and then go home? That's not good enough. That's not good enough. They are using our money to approve in infrastructural projects, which it are not beneficial to Hong Kong people. Are you going to vote and lose every time and you go home and go to sleep and sleep very well? That is not good enough. Uh, so this is one struggle uh, about the democracy movement in Hong Kong. And then, so recently, uh, there was a kind of a discussion, especially among the localists, about a so-called torch earth. Uh, strategy. They said that, uh, okay, 40% is not meaningful. Let's boycott the elections, withdraw altogether from it, because, uh, and then go back to the streets and do something else, because you are only going to legitimize the system, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, this has been a struggle, but, uh, and then don't vote. Otherwise, I, I, and in any case, your vote doesn't matter that much. And, but of course, uh, I would say for, for the time being, the mainstream Democrats still believe that that minority platform is important in the legislature to stage some sort of opposition. And of course, the resources are still important uh, in terms of uh, sustaining the movement uh, over a long period of time. The third is the class issue. The class issue is tricky. Tricky in the sense that um, a lot of these pro-democracy leaders came from a social movement background. So they had social movement, social democratic roots. They were kind of more sympathetic with the grassroots uh, since the 1970s. And also the second important factor is that the business was so dominant. Hong Kong is a place which income e equality was, it was and is very high. And then a lot of people believe that it is because the business is the biggest Western interest. And there is a lot of government business collusion uh, accused by the media, accused by the opposition. So naturally, you should side with a kind of a more risk distributive policy. But the dynamic of the Democrats is that actually they enjoy better support from the middle class because ideologically they pledge rule of law, freedom, human rights, and these are Western liberalist values which enjoy better echo among middle class voters. Uh, the poor voters actually don't care about that much about human rights. They think that, uh, okay, stability may be more important. You occupy central, you occupy the major streets so that I cannot go back to work. You are bad for me. And then uh, the middle class may understand a little bit better that, okay, you need to sacrifice if you want democracy. If you, you need to sacrifice if you want human rights. But 
then uh, talk to a less educated uh, blue collar worker. Of course, not too many blue, blue collar workers left in Hong Kong. And then uh, or a truck driver and uh, who, who got the roads blocked by you guys, students. Then he would say that, uh, go to hell. <laughs> and then, uh, so this is one of the struggle that is the lower class actually in the recent years, they were actually more supportive of the pro-government side. Uh, because, uh, one reason, because they were very resourceful. They did a lot of uh, material giveaways at the local level. And then uh, and also old people. And old, old people got a lot of benefits from these pro-Beijing camps, uh, parties. And then, uh, so this was a kind of a struggle. Uh, even you, they are not going to totally readjust their uh, policy platforms to a kind of a very redistributive uh, uh, platform because uh, it may not be able to attract the lower class voters. And the main ideological uh, hit of them is still these very middle class values, human rights, freedom, autonomy, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, okay, I'll come to the 2014 umbrella movement. This set up for the backdrop of the 2014 umbrella movement. If you don't know, look it up, okay? And then uh, Google it. And then uh, 2014 umbrella movement, it was uh, when uh, Hong Kong people occupy the free urban sites uh, for 79 days. And it grew out of a kind of a trend of radicalization since I would say 2008. Uh, it was not very accurate, but uh, I could see that coming in Hong Kong. That they grew out of a kind of uh, frustration that began beginning sometime. Sometime uh, a, a lot of people began to say, "We have tried everything: petitions, rallies, hunger strikes. Uh, to the extent that hunger strikes today are going to be ridiculed in Hong Kong, that you 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 just." You just go fasting because you want to lose weight, right? Uh, you, you just, uh, that, that is not going to put any pressure on Beijing. And then, um, and then so you need to try something more radical, uh, something more drastic. So uh, it originated, the occupation uh, movement originated from Professor Benitai. Uh, uh, as he himself described it, it was a political accident. He just wrote a newspaper article. Uh, it, of course, he was inspired by occupation movements all over the world, Egypt, uh, Turkey, etc. And then he suggested that if uh, 2017, uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, because 2007, the Le National People's Congress actually promised that uh, the 2017 CE can be elected by universal suffrage. The Chinese term can be is a very tricky term. You can be rich tomorrow. <laughs> that doesn't guarantee anything, right? Uh, uh, you can be a billionaire next year. Yeah, you can get your PhD degree tomorrow. And then, uh, but a lot of things, uh, the major issue is about nomination. Because if you read basic law carefully, Article 45, actually says the ultimate aim is the achievement of universal suffrage through nomination by a nomination committee, uh, broadly representative nomination committee uh, in accordance with democratic procedures. So what does that mean? So for a number of years, the Democrats have been suspecting that all along what Beijing has in mind is that they control the nomination. And then they put forward two or three names to you, and then you can cast one person, one vote. So they are going to give you Regina Ip, Si Wai Leung, and Carrie Lam. And then you can choose. And what difference does it make? Hairstyle? Uh, gender? And then, uh, so, uh, so Benetai's uh, suggestion was that we want genuine democracy. We want a kind of free nomination. So if Beijing is not going to promise that, 
we will stage a, some kind of occupying central movement that we just sit down in the uh, central, central business district of Hong Kong, paralyze uh, transportation, and then that would be an international event that would create a lot of public opinion pressure. And of course, a lot of groups think that it is, thought that it is a very good idea because we have tried everything else. So we just drum in. So in the end, of course, uh, August, 8, August 31st, 2014, uh, Beijing handed down the uh, verdict. It, it said that uh, 2017 CE can be elected by universal suffrage, but it would be after a nomination by, the, by a nomination committee, and that nomination committee should be similar to the election committee that is currently electing the CE. So in that sense, that means that they can control the majority, and every candidate should get majority support from the nomination committee before his or her name can be put on the ballot. So it is candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, but they are all approved by Beijing. So by international standards, by ICCPR standards, this is not democracy because you can screen out people that you don't like, uh, namely the Democrats. Uh, or some other people, maybe John Zhang or, or some other moderate people. And then uh, I, my, my take at that time on the issue is a Iranian system. You look at Iran and then they have a kind of a top level committee uh, formed by the priests, religious leaders, who would screen the candidates before they were put to one person, one vote. And we won't call that democracy. So that led to ultimately the outbreak of the umbrella movement, which occupied the streets for seven to nine days, but of course, to no avail. Uh, in the end, Beijing did not budge an inch, and then we uh, end up with the same system five years after the ending of the uh, occupation. So this is the last slide. I will talk about the post-UM umbrella movement dynamics. It's one thing, uh, the Democrats, are in a kind of a uh, very difficult situation because after the umbrella movement, there is, it seems that there is no effective strategy. No effective strategy in the sense that the same phrase can be repeated after you have occupied the streets for 79 days and Beijing did not give you anything. What are you going to do next? You are not going to start an arm uprising and you are not going to win. And I'm uprising, right? The PLA is at the doorsteps. And then, uh, so what are you going to do? You have almost tried everything peacefully. And then, uh, the, and after 2012, actually we saw a kind of a conservative turn in China, that they are cramping down on dissidents only within China. And to put it in another perspective, it is very difficult to imagine China being very conservative to its own people within the mainland and they adopt a very liberal attitude to Hong Kong. Why, why would they do that? So uh, in the last few years, we see more and more control from Beijing, uh, more, and more, more and more violation of autonomy. So one important uh, uh, outcome was the rise of so-called uh, so localism. The localism, actually, if you qualify it, actually it has a wide, relatively wide range in terms of political spectrum, from asking outright sovereignty independence, that Hong Kong is a separate nation, that we should build our sovereign state, to self-determination, to some form of uh, uh, Hong Kong people as a priority, etc. But uh, of course, in the eyes of Beijing leaders, they saw it as separatism then gave them a perfect excuse to cram down on any kinds of democratic movement in Hong Kong. And also, which is good for Chinese propaganda purposes. That is, that all these guys who ask for dem democracy are in fact separatists. Uh, they are the same as the Tibetans, uh, pro-Taiwan independentists, and then, uh, and then Xinjiang, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it would be even more difficult to engage China in terms of any kind of dialogue, at least for the time being, as, as we are speaking at uh, 2019. And there is the help, kind of a general sense of helplessness and demobilization. So uh, before 2014, 
I could see a kind of a cycle of mobilization, upswing of mobilization, uh, because there was hope. A lot of people believe that we, if we mobilize hard enough, we could force Beijing into some kind of political concession. But after 2014, we saw a, a, a kind of a decline in terms of public participation in rallies, demonstrations. The general sentiment was that uh, the number of people did not matter. We are not going to stage an even more impressive movement than the umbrella movement. So if the umbrella movement didn't make it, then what could we do? The government is not going to listen to us. So this is uh, a, a kind of general sentiment, especially among young people, uh, after they have spent so much time uh, mobilizing uh, during the umbrella movement. And then there was a kind of a split between the localists and the, the mainstream Democrats. Uh, that was actually repeated time and again, that uh, the more radical elements accuse the mainstream Democrats, you have been leading the movement for 30 years, you achieved nothing, so you should go. You should, you should be wiped out before we can have any success. And then the mainstream Democrats would say that you are too radical. You are too radical hurting our chances of winning, democr uh, winning democracy, winning over uh, Beijing. And then uh, uh, you, you are counterproductive. And then, uh, and then the local says, that, so you are very productive, right? And then what have you produced over the years? So uh, and if you look at the uh, democracy movement by 2018-19, and then, uh, sorry to say, it is relatively difficult for me to portray a kind of a very rosy picture. That is, it, it is very de uh, demoralized and fragmented, infighting, uh, I spend a lot of time in infighting, be partly because uh, it seems that there is nobody can provide any definite answers for how to move the system forward, how to move the movement forward, and how to move the system forward, and how to make China change its minds. So uh, I will kind of uh, stop here and then see uh, what questions do you have. <laughs>